So clap our hands, come on. One, two, three, hey! Let every place that is fresh, come on. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, click. Let every place that is fresh, praise the Lord, come on. I praise in the valley.
welcome you into this place this morning. We just thank you for your presence here and that we know you will move only the way you can move. Amen, Gateway.
God and where we are gathered in his name he will move amen lift up your praises for him once again he is so worthy he is so mighty he is a wonderful God I'm 
nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one's wrist Here we go. 
house of God to just honor and honor Him. Amen. Oh, can we just move around, take a few steps and look at your neighbors? The glory of the Lord is with them. Bless them with your beautiful smile. Shake your hands, give them a hug. And after that, turn your eyes on the screen for the announcements. Thank you, Gateway, for worshiping with us. That was beautiful. Amen. Good morning, Gateway. Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. It's a great day to be in God's house, and we are so glad that each and every one of you are here with us today. If you're a guest with us, we want to extend an extra special Gateway welcome to you. We are so glad that you chose to come and spend your Sunday with us at Gateway. Our prayer is that you feel so welcomed and encouraged in today's service. And if you are that guest and you don't have a church home of your very own, don't make this your last Sunday at Gateway. Come back and join us again and get to know us better. For all of those first time guests, we do have a guest gift bag for you. So at the end of today's service, you can head to the table at the southwest corner of the auditorium where a Gateway volunteer will be happy to give you a guest bag if you let them know it's your first time at Gateway today. Thank you for joining us. For all of you parents of Gateway Junior Youth ages 7 to 11, please be reminded that your next event is today following the second service starting at 1 and going until 3 p.m. It's a busy few months here at Gateway, so I'm going to run some dates and events by you quickly, so make sure you pay close attention. Starting this coming Wednesday at 10.30 a.m., there's a brand new book reading connect group called After the Rapture by Dr. David Jeremiah. So if you'd like to get in on this book reading, it starts this Wednesday at 10.30 a.m. right here at the church. Easter weekend is right around the corner next weekend, and we are going to celebrate together as a church family. There are three services that you can get in on starting on Good Friday, March 29th at 1030 a.m. We are going to come together and remember the sacrifice Jesus made by dying on the cross. And then Resurrection Sunday is March 31st, and we are going to have two services at 9.30 and 11.30, where we celebrate that Jesus has risen. Now, these are great opportunities to invite friends and family to join you for church. So we encourage you, think of someone you can invite and bring them to church with you next weekend, and let's celebrate Easter together. Our annual report is coming up on Wednesday, April 3rd at 7 p.m. right here at the church. This is a simple meeting where we look back at 2023 and project with faith for 2024. So we encourage you, come on out and hear about the good things God is going to do at Gateway in 2024. Coming up on Sunday, April 7th, we are excited to be hosting Dr. Niyi Borire right here at Gateway. Dr. Niyi is a neurologist and a leadership expert, and he is going to be with us in both services on Sunday, April 7th at 9.30 and 11.30. So make sure you're here to hear the good word that he will be bringing. On Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m., we are getting ready to celebrate here at Gateway. That is our next water baptism celebration. So for all of you Gateway family, please come out and celebrate and cheer on those that have taken that next step and are being water baptized on Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m. Come and celebrate with us. Now that was a lot of dates and events that I went through, so if you can't remember them all, no problem. Head to gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening, where you will find our online church calendar with everything going on here at the church in the upcoming weeks. Thank you, Gateway, for your continued giving into God's house. Because of your giving, your faithfulness and obedience to God's word, we are able to keep pointing people to Jesus, and that is what it is all about. So there are three ways you can continue to give today. The first way is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. The second way to give is by giving online. Head to gatewayonline.ca slash give where you can follow the prompts to pay by card or PayPal. And the third way to give is text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. That's all I got for you, Gateway. So have a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here on Good Friday at 1030 and on Easter Sunday at 930 and 1130. Now, Pastor Brian, over to you for the next part in our series, Dropping Hints on Route to Jerusalem. All right. Good afternoon, Gateway. Happy Palm Sunday. Come on. If you don't have a palm branch, you can just wave the palms of your hands. The Lord understands your body language. We're really glad to have you here this afternoon. We are continuing our Easter sermon series, but it is titled Dropping Hints en Route to Jerusalem. You know, one of the most common ways in, in life to, to drop hints is 
is when you're sending signals to somebody that you kind of like them and, and you're wondering if they might be interested potentially in maybe a dating relationship. And there was one guy who was, he was the new guy in his workplace, middle-aged man. And after he'd been there for several weeks, he couldn't help but notice that, that there was a, a younger lady, certainly younger than him, and, and, uh, and she seemed to be keeping her eye on him, and they had a few little exchanges in coming and going. And then one day, he was in the lunchroom, and she approached him, and she said, do you mind my asking, are you married, or are you in a committed relationship? And he thought to himself, wow, if that's not a hint, I don't know what is. And so he was trying to mask his excitement and stay cool, and he said, well, as a matter of fact, no, I'm not in a steady relationship. And she, she said, oh, good, because neither is my mom. I'd really like you to meet her. <laughs> Why, you little matchmaker, you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, a hint is not always what you thought it was going to be, but I guarantee you can trust the hints that Jesus drops. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, before we get into this preach, would you stand to your feet and would you boldly repeat after me, I love God, therefore I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel, my pride and passion is to follow his example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say amen? Come on, somebody shout Hosanna! Yeah, good for you for being in the house of God today. You can be seated. And just a quick word of welcome to those who are joining us online. Listen, if you've been watching online, if we don't know you, by all means, get in touch. We would love to meet you. If you're watching from Hawaii, I would be happy to make a pastoral visit. Yes, I would. <laughs> all right, this is going to be part three in our series. We've been following the travels of, of Jesus and company as they are counting down the days until they get to Jerusalem for a date with the cross. And all the while, Jesus is dropping hints about what is waiting for them when they get there. He's like, guys, I'm going to be handed over to the authorities. They're going to rough me up pretty good. They're going to spit on me. They're going to crucify me. But no worries. On the third day, I'm going to be raised back to life again. It's all good. But the problem was, it seemed like some of his words were just ricocheting off the foreheads of the disciples. That's probably one of the reasons why some of those disciples were partially bald. But the point is, they didn't get it, at least not right away. See, Jesus' followers had a case of spiritual blindness. And that's what this Easter sermon series is all about, overcoming spiritual blindness. So Jesus keeps dropping these hints about how it's all going to play out. And so today we're going to take a good look at the 19th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. That's where we're going. Luke chapter 19. So come with me and let's find out what we can learn from the hint dropper, Jesus of Nazareth. This is one of the final stops that Jesus and his entourage made en route to Jerusalem. It's less than one week now from, from Good Friday, and it's crunch time, and Jesus is like, guys, there are some really crucial issues that I need you to understand before they arrest me next Thursday night. And so, folks, I, I believe that in this chapter, there's at least three very significant hints that are intentionally dropped by Jesus for his disciples then, and for the benefit of you and I to pick up on as well. So are you ready? Let's go to the city of Jericho. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And a man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Yeah, he was, he was wealthy, all right. He was wealthy based on what we call ill-gotten gain. He was, he was a publican. He was a tax collector. And he was despised by everyone in town. People did not like the publicans, because everyone knew they were on the take. And, and the Bible tells us he was not only one of these publicans, he was the chief publican in that region. And so you could say he was the chief thief. But verse 3 says he wanted to see who Jesus was. 
But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. And so he ran on ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. He got a better vantage point from up in the tree since Jesus was coming that way down Main Street in Jericho. Verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he stopped and he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. It says all the people saw this and they began to mutter. What a word that is. They were muttering, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Do I detect a tone of self-righteous judgmentalism? I think so. In between verse 7 and 8, the scene shifts from Main Street to Zacchaeus' condo. And so now they're at Zacchaeus' place. Verse 8 says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I, this man has come under conviction for sure. Just being around the Lord is producing a change of heart in it. If I've cheated anything, uh, anybody out of anything, well, Lord, I will pay back four times the amount. This radical change of of lifestyle. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. Now get this. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Hint, hint. Folks, this is what I call the friend of sinners. Hint. Jesus uses this visit to Zacchaeus's place as a teachable moment, especially for his crew of, of disciples. He drops this hint. Gentlemen, I've come to seek and save people who are lost. Yeah, yeah, people who are sinners, and they know they're sinners, and they know that they need a Savior. People whose behavior is pretty reprehensible. People who feel ashamed of themselves, and, and people who are messed up in, admittedly, and, 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 and they want to get their lives turned around again. He said, I've come to lift people out of the miry clay, not to rub their nose in the mud. In other words, I didn't come to condemn I came to extend saving grace. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. See, this episode with Zacchaeus is very much akin to the remarks that Jesus made a little bit earlier on in, in Luke chapter 5, verse 27. It says, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector. Here's another, another one of these tax collectors, these publicans. He found another one by the name of Levi, otherwise known as Matthew. He was sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Those are familiar words, yeah. He's inviting Jesus to become one of his team of, of disciples. And so Levi got up and he left everything and he followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd of tax collectors, uh, his, his colleagues, right, his cronies in, in the publican business. And he's invited these guys over. And, and there were others there that were eating with them that day as well. And so, so here's, here's Levi. Well, he invites all of the other tax collectors, all of the other crooks in town to come over and meet Jesus. And, and he makes the announcement, guys, I've decided to have a career change. I want you to meet my new boss, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 30, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to the disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them. This is classic Jesus. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous or the self-righteous. I come to call sinners to repentance. You get it? That's his target audience, sinners. Folks, have you noticed this in the travels of Jesus? He didn't avoid sinners. No, if anything, he gravitated toward them. Not so that he could become one of them, but so that he could win them over to the kingdom, right? Jesus totally earned his reputation for being called a friend of sinners. That's recorded in Matthew 11, verse 19. And when the religious leaders, when they called Jesus a friend of sinners, wow, they, they thought that they were, they were using derogatory terms, right? They, they, they meant it as name calling, you know, with a negative connotation. But I'm pretty sure Jesus took it as a compliment when they called him a friend 
of sinners. All right, let's come back to Luke 19, the case of Zacchaeus. Do you see in this story the element of spiritual blindness? I mean, it's clear as day in verse 7. It says the crowd, they're standing. So, so Jesus and Zacchaeus, they, they've headed over to Zacchaeus' place and some of the disciples, maybe a few others along with as well. And, and they left the crowd in, in, in the street of Jericho that day and they were, they were muttering. I can't believe that Jesus would go over to Zacchaeus and say, that guy is as crooked as a snake. Why Zacchaeus? <laughs> See, spiritual blindness tends to be quite judgmental, kind of legalistic, right? Condemning, despising, prideful, uh, you know, a condescending attitude. If you ever have some spiritual blindness in your system, it's real easy to you know, to spot somebody that maybe has veered off course a little bit morally. Next thing you know, you're feeling kind of a critical spirit toward that person, right? Because the more you criticize somebody else, the more you feel good about yourself, right? Isn't that crazy the way that works? Listen, here's these people in Jericho, and they're stunned to think that of all the decent folks in, in their community, that Jesus would choose to go to the home of Zacchaeus. Like, that guy has ripped off more people than you can shake a stick at. But the whole point that Jesus was trying to make is kind of similar to the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where he says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. I love the way it's worded in the Phillips translation where sin abounds, grace super abounds. Do you remember the story about the guy who went to the doctor one day having headaches? Doc, you've got to help me figure out what's causing these headaches. And the doctor, he starts probing a little bit. He starts asking some questions. You know, do you, you do any heavy smoking or heavy drinking? No. Doctor, you, you know that I'm a Christian. I don't have bad habits like that. Just checking. Do you have stress? Is stress an issue? Anxiety? Pressures at work? Anything like that? No way. Doctor, I've been a Christian for over 20 years now. I've learned how to cast all my cares upon the Lord because He cares for me. I don't worry about anything. All right, all right, just ask it. How about, do you have any degree of guilty conscience? You know, if you've done something wrong and you're feeling bad about that, or maybe if somebody has wronged you and you're holding some feelings of resentment or unforgiveness, anything like that, Doc, I'm offended that you would even ask. Listen, I'm a good Christian, I told you, and I don't do wrong. Oh. The doctor said, you know what? I think I figured out what the problem is, what's causing those headaches. Well, what is it, doc? Spit it out. I think your halo is screwed on a little bit too tight. <laughs> All right, I want a second opinion. <laughs> I say, Holy Spirit, deliver us from any degree of self-righteousness and judgmentalism. And, and Lord, give us a revelation of grace. 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 Give us a revelation of what it means to be a person who is a friend of sinners. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He gives revelation, which is just the opposite of spiritual blindness. He can make it so real to us. He can show us what the grace of God is all about. He does that by, by dealing graciously with us when, when we are stuck in some of our sins and wrongs, doings. And, and come on, how many of you, God has dealt graciously even in your worst moments. And when the grace of God gets into our system, next thing you know, we become these people who deal graciously with others around us. Come on, somebody say amen. That's how this thing works. You see, when we make the intelligent decision, to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior. That's a rude awakening because somebody explains to us, well, you are a sinner and you need to receive Christ and receive forgiveness for your sin. Well, wait a minute, who are you calling a sinner? Right? It's a rude awakening when you, you come to this basic realization, hey, we're all in the same boat. Every human being was born into the world in a sin fallen condition. We have inherited that from Adam and Eve. And the sooner we come to the realization, all right, all right, I admit I'm a sinner in need of God's saving grace. Wow, now we can get somewhere, right? It doesn't matter how respectable of a citizen you were or how nasty of a rascal you were when the gospel comes your way. If you respond and, and you're just willing to admit, 
I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Then the Lord says, all right, now we can work with you. Revolutionize your life by saving grace. You understand John 3.16. I mean, everybody knows John 3.16. Many of you can recite that in your sleep. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Somebody say amen. Amen. Yeah, but the fact is the following verse, verse 17, should always be connected to verse 16 because it goes on and says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus said, guys, hint, hint, I came to seek and save sinners. People that have have fallen prey to the darkness and the deception of the devil. When sin has messed us up, that's when we need to receive the saving grace of Jesus Christ and get untangled and and get on our way serving the Lord. Somebody say amen. Yeah, he he saves us. And, and, and And then he teaches us how to be gracious to others. So we're not about condemning those who are in sin. We become friends to them. Listen carefully. As followers of Jesus, we become like our fearless leader. We emulate what he has modeled for us. So our heart beats the way Jesus' heart beats. So, so when we cross paths with people who are the, the lost, and the last, and the the least, people who are sinners, people who have hurt others, people who have been hurt by others, people who Paul was describing when when he he said in Titus chapter 3 and verse 3, he was describing what life was like for us before we became believers. He said, "We, we were hating and hated. What a Bible commentary that is, hating and hated. And Jesus came to rescue us from that. But listen, when we cross paths with people who are in these troubling situations, what is our sentiment? We certainly don't call them scumbags. Come on, no way. We don't even think that. We, we respond in compassion. Somebody say amen. Amen. We respond in mercy. We respond in grace. We respond in forgiveness, right? To use Paul's words from Romans chapter 14, verse 15. Pardon me. Yes, chapter 14, verse 15. Paul used these these four words. Oh, Holy Spirit, just etch these four words in the consciousness of every one of us in this room that we can see every person we ever meet as a precious individual for whom Christ died. Everybody say, for whom Christ died. Oh yeah, even if somebody has messed up big time, they are still a person for whom Christ died. Folks, do you know where I do my best preaching? I would like to be able to tell you that it's right here at Gateway, but that would not be true. My best preaching is out at the correctional center. No kidding around. I get out there for our, you know, every second Sunday of the month. We get to go out in the evening and do chapel service out there. And man, I have more liberty to preach there than anywhere else on the map. I just take my Bible, no notes, and just preach. And wow, the Holy Spirit gives me liberty. I I know what you're thinking. Well, Pastor, why don't you do that here? Because I've tried and it just doesn't work for me here. I've asked the Lord about this. Why is that? I don't know. He hasn't given me the answer. Listen, if you want to hear me preach at my best, you've got to get yourself arrested. <laughs> you just make, the, make sure the charges are not too serious because it's got to be two years less a day or you'll be going to the pen instead. And we will not cross paths. <laughs> But I'm just so glad. I hope you're glad with me that the Lord has seen fit to create a church culture here at Gateway that is a culture of love, acceptance, and forgiveness that is so blessed. Jesus dropped this hint. Guys, I will soon be gone, and I need you to catch a hold of this this concept because if I am a friend of sinners, then when I'm gone, you need to learn to befriend sinners. Guys, you mustn't drop this ball, and they didn't. 
If you read on into the book of Acts, you will see that it's really true that the culture of the New Testament church became a culture of befriending sinners. And now you and I are living in chapter 10,000 of the book of Acts, right? So I'm asking you, do you know people who fit this description? Sinners? I mean, it sounds a little harsh, but we're all born in that situation. How do you feel about sinners? If you detect any sense of spiritual blindness rattling around in your system, are you open to a little attitude adjustment? A little infusion of the grace of God so that you can see through that lens. Are you open to a little halo adjustment? Yeah. Holy Spirit, give us a revelation of God's grace. Come on. Everybody say, Christ in me is a friend of sinners. All right, let's move on. Let's come back to Luke chapter 19. Let's check out another one of the hints that Jesus dropped. Luke 19, verse 11. While they were listening to this, listening to what? Well, they're still in Zacchaeus' living room, and they're listening to the previous verse, where Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. While they're listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Yeah, so they're still in Zacchaeus' home, and Jesus drops a hint by telling a parable. See, this verse 11 very clearly points out public perception was the kingdom of God was about to be established with Jesus at the helm. You know, he's going to come to Jerusalem and he's going to overthrow the Roman government and and then Jesus is going to reign over us, or so they thought. That's not how it's going to happen. Now, you and I know that from our vantage point, but they didn't. They thought, hey, Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, and he's going to set up the kingdom of God and push the Romans out of the way. That's what they were expecting. But Jesus knew that they were thinking this, and so he gave this parable. Verse 12, he said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants and he gave them 10 minas. A mina, that's a measure of money. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Now, if you were to read on the rest of that parable, when the master returns, he checks in with his servants to see how they made out while he was gone. And the first man said, well, sir, the mina that you gave me has earned 10 more minas. Wow, thousand percent increase. The master is favorably impressed. He says, in that case, I'm going to put you in charge of 10 cities. Wow. The second man said, sir, the mina that you gave me has produced five more minas. And the boss said, good for you. You're going to have jurisdiction over five cities. Well done. And and then the third man said, sir, I didn't want to lose the mina that you gave me. So I buried it. And I, I just kind of sat on it. The boss said, well, why didn't you at least invest it so I could have some interest when I return? And he was not impressed. Folks, in the telling of this parable, Jesus is dropping a huge hint. Like in the past couple of Sundays, Jesus was dropping hints, right? We talked about his death and and his burial, his resurrection. He says, guys, this is what's going to happen to me. And so if the disciples, if they were able, because he had to keep on repeating it, and that spiritual blindness was really interfering with these guys grasping this. But if and when they were able to wrap their minds around this disturbing information, and once they got over the shock, then they naturally would be thinking, okay, okay, so Jesus is going to die. That's bad, but he's going to be alive again, so that's good. And then when, when he's alive again, then, then he'll set up his kingdom and oust the Roman government, and he'll begin to reign as, as Messiah King, and we'll reign with him. Hallelujah. It's all going to work out wonderfully be very easy for them to think that way. And Jesus knew that that's what they were thinking, verse 11. And so he tells us this story about the master who leaves and goes to a far country, a.k.a. heaven, to receive kingship and then to return later on, much later on as it turns out. But he tells this parable, and then he's like, hint, hint, guys, 
The master in that story is me, Jesus. See, after I deal with this old rugged cross, I'm going to be leaving for a while. Quite a while. But I will return as king. But fellas, you have to understand that the time to overthrow earthly kingdoms is not yet. Sorry to shatter your dreams. You're still going to have to contend with some secular governments for a while. Folks, even after Jesus rose from the dead, even then the disciples, they're still quizzing him about this. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? You're going to take over? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set by his own authority. It's like, gentlemen, remember back a few weeks ago when we were at Zacchaeus' place? Remember I told you that story about the master who went away to a far country? Remember, that's me. And I'm going to be leaving real soon here. And I'm going to be gone for a while. It would be very natural for them to say, well, how long are you going to be gone? I don't know. Only the Father knows, and he ain't telling. Now listen carefully. Jesus tells this parable to help them to get it, that he's leaving them for an indefinite period of time. But this story is also designed to emphasize that while he is away, he wants them to take what he has given them to work with and make the best possible use of it for the purpose of his kingdom. And then, of course, he's going to return later on and reward them accordingly. Now, think about it. Ladies and gentlemen, after 2,000 years of the master's absence, can you see that it'd be so easy for a little spiritual blindness to set in and cloud the vision of, of the New Testament church? That's us. And instead of actively being about our father's business, that we would just be, uh, you know, kind of, kind of digressing to a situation where now we're, we're just attending to our own business and doing a little churchianity on the side. Like when Jesus first left, you know, they think, okay, like those guys in the parable, I want to, I want to win as many people. I want to gather as many minus as I can into the kingdom. And they were going full speed ahead. Man, that first hundred years of the early church, they were aggressive. They were about their father's business. But, but 2,000 years later, can you understand that it's really possible to say, wow, he's been gone a long time now. And instead of being, a, a, you know, a, 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 avidly about our father's business, very easy for us to just be going about our our own business you understand what i'm saying we can't do that we cannot do that oh how insidious is spiritual blindness that creeps in i say holy spirit gives a fresh revelation of what what's in that parable for us give us a fresh revelation of the fact that jesus is coming soon to a planet near you We need to be actively engaged. We need to be readily involved. We need to make our lives count for the kingdom. Come on, whatever the Lord has given us to work with, all of our God-given gifts and (coughs) God-given, excuse me, resources, all of our God-given opportunities. Anybody here have any friends or family? Wow. We have opportunities, every one of us, to reach out and do the bidding of our Lord. While he's gone, because he's coming back. He's coming back. Oh, Holy Spirit, challenge every one of us to rise up and make, make our time useful as we wait on the return of Jesus. Come on, somebody help me out with an amen. Yeah, make a fresh commitment to the Lord today. I urge upon you, get more involved. Invest yourself in greater ways in what the Lord is doing in our generation. I assure you it will pay off. All right, I want to show you one more hint that Jesus dropped here in Luke chapter 19. After all, this is Palm Sunday, right? So Luke 19, now we're in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, said what? After he finished telling that parable, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. So it's time for the triumphal entry. 
Verse 29, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you're going to find a colt tied there. Now, don't be fooled by that term colt. It's actually a young donkey. He said, you're going to find a colt, a young donkey tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, well, what do you think you're doing? <laughs> Why are you untying my donkey? Tell him the Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and they found it just as he had told them, of course. And as they were untying the colt, sure enough, the owners of the colt asked them, why are you untying the colt? Why are you stealing my colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Now, the text doesn't tell us, but apparently the, the owner must have said, oh, it's for Jesus. Well, in that case, you are welcome to use my car. I, I mean, my donkey. But I must warn you, I got, I got to warn you before you take off with that donkey. And probably one of the disciples said, don't tell me, let me guess. This donkey's never been ridden before. How did you know? Oh, yeah, that's right. You work for Jesus. That's, that's how you know. Now, listen, if Jesus came to Regina and a couple of his disciples showed up on your doorstep and said, the Lord needs to borrow your car. I know what your response would be. You'd be like, here's the keys. <laughs> Just make sure you bring it back with a full tank of gas. <laughs> but verse 35 says, they brought it to Jesus. And they threw their cloaks on the colt, and they put Jesus on it. And he went along, and people spread their cloaks on the road. And I am pretty sure that that young donkey was thinking, wow, what did I do to deserve such royal red carpet treatment as this? Thought it was for him, but it really was for Jesus. Verse 37, when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, and so on. This is the event that is known as the triumphal entry. It's the beginning of the Passion Week, and Jesus would be crucified just five days later. But folks, as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, Wow, there is just so much fanfare. There's palm branch waving, and even the children are getting into the act. Everybody's chanting, Hosanna. I mean, it's just a promenade of praise. But I believe that Jesus was hoping that there was one very significant fact that would not be lost in the midst of the celebration like is anybody noticing the fact that I'm riding on a donkey? Please pick up on that. Hint, hint. See, everyone in the ancient Eastern world would be very, very well familiar with, with the imagery. here. To enter the city riding on a donkey, that would be associated with humbleness. Everybody say humble. But to enter the city riding on a horse, especially if it was a white horse, that would be symbolic of a conquering king. And Jesus entered Jerusalem that day on the back of a humble donkey. Now that in itself was, was a, a miracle, right? That he could ride that donkey that day without in incident, right? Remember, it, it said in verse 30, that donkey has never been ridden before. Right? I mean, every time I, I read that verse, it reminds me of what I, I read years ago about a, a recreational ranch somewhere down in Arizona. It's a place where city slickers and tourists go to do some horseback riding. And, 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 and the story goes that, that on the corral, they had a sign posted and the sign said, we have horses for all kinds of people. For big people, we have big horses. For smaller people, we have smaller horses. For experienced riders, we have horses that will gallop. And for people who have never ridden a horse before, we have horses that have never been ridden before. <laughs> Down the bottom of the sign, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, Jesus rode into Jerusalem that day on the back of a donkey that had never been ridden before. And when the day was done... 
Nobody got bitten by that donkey. Nobody got kicked by that donkey. Nobody got bucked off of that donkey. And nobody had to drag that stubborn beast of burden to get it to kick into gear. No, that animal was totally cooperative. That was a miracle right there, wasn't it? You don't want to deal with a donkey that's never been ridden before and jump on and go for a ride. No, sir. Jesus can do it. Folks, that day the air was full of jubilation. But the air was also full of spiritual blindness. People were chanting, Hosanna, which is a term that means save now, O Lord. But, but the crowds in the streets of Jerusalem that day, their understanding of that, that term salvation, save, save us, Lord, their understanding of that was completely different from what you and I know when, when we say, Lord, save me, save my buddy. Yeah, they, they were thinking in terms of, of Jesus saving them from the Roman Empire. See, to them, this was more like a political rally. There was serious unrest in Israel. They'd been under the oppressive Roman regime since 63 B.C. So at this point, it's been 93 years, and they are just chafing under Roman rule. They were so ready for a military coup. They longed for their Messiah deliverer to come on the scene. And they thought that Jesus was their man, the miracle worker from Nazareth. And he was their man. But he wasn't going to go about his kingship in the way that they thought. In fact, when all was said and done, after all the celebrating in the streets that day, if you read on in these chapters, you find that when Jesus got into Jerusalem, it was pretty anticlimactic. He looked around for a while, and at the end of the day, he left town and went back to Bethany and stayed the night, came back the following day. Huh. In fact, a couple of days later, he made that famous statement, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. That does not sound like a man who is intent on, on overthrowing the local government. You see, what we have here is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, and yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. See, he didn't, he didn't come to be a savior by force. He came to be a savior humbly. By laying his life down. Salvation for you and I required a humble act of self-sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. See, spiritual blindness is a strange thing. Sometimes spiritual blindness speaks out and seems to make sense. And it sounds pretty clever, spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness might actually propose an idea that sounds something like this. The world is messed up. We need a savior. And so the son of God comes to planet earth. How awesome. God in the flesh. He can just set up his, his reign and become the king of all earthly kings and the Lord of all earthly lords. And all of us that want to, we will worship him and live happily ever after. Sounds pretty good, but it doesn't work that way. Come on, if you know your stuff, you know it does not work that way. There had to be a cross. There had to be a death. There had to be a gush of blood. See, before there's a horse, there's got to be a donkey. Oh, there's going to be a horse. Oh, you can read it for yourself in Revelation chapter 19. Oh, yeah, there's coming a day when Jesus is coming back on a white horse. Revelation 19. It is a phenomenon. In fact, it's probably the most glorious vision of Jesus described in the entire Bible. He's coming back on that, on that white horse. He's got, he's got the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords emblazoned on his thighs. And he, he is a sight. 
You can do your homework and read it for yourself. Yeah, the day is coming when he will return on a horse as a glorious, powerful king. And he will put the nations in their place. And he will swiftly settle the matter of Armageddon and come to the defense of Israel. I tell you, it's going to be a marvelous day for planet Earth when Jesus comes back on a horse. Oh, yeah, you know it. That day is coming. It might be sooner than you think. But that was not what was happening when Jesus entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He came on a donkey. Oh, yeah, before there can be a horse, there's got to be a donkey. Before there can be a throne, there's got to be a cross. Do we get it? Jesus had to die. And so he did so willingly, so voluntarily. It says in Philippians chapter 2 that he humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. He did that for you and for me. It was the most gracious act of loving kindness known to humanity. And many have flatly refused to take God up on his offer of salvation. I don't get that. But there are multiplied, multiplied millions who have, who have, have, have received this good news of the gospel. They say, Jesus, you did that for me. A humble Savior who laid his life down as a friend of sinners. And he catches us on the rebound. Oh, yeah, we get this spiritual rebirth. We get this promise of heaven later on. All of the other goods that we are entitled to as a part of our inheritances. As as men and women who are awakened to the fact that, man, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. So Jesus, please come into my life. I'm prepared to to serve you and be loyal to your kingship forever. That's about the wisest decision we'll ever make in our entire life. But you know, the humility of the Savior should have this deep and profound and lasting effect on every one of us. And the effect that it has on us is that it humbles us. It would be just just so humble to think, Jesus, you did that for me. Thank you. Thank you, oh Lord. I could never thank you enough. Just receive my heart of worship. Oh, Jesus. I so appreciate who you are to me. So he drops these hints so that we can be enlightened, so that we can have this spiritual awakening, so that the Holy Spirit can give us a revelation that helps us overcome any spiritual blindness. Man, if there's been any of that spiritual blindness operating in your life that that causes you to frown on sinners, as of this day, let that change. Oh, man, we got, we got our work cut out for us. Man, when you go out those doors, your assignment is be a friend of sinners. You never know whose life can be dramatically changed by the good news of the gospel just because you reached out to them. Because you took the word of God to heart and said, man, I, I, I'm not going to be down on, on people who don't live right anymore. Now I'm going to do what I can to reach out and extend the grace of Jesus. Every one of us, an agent of grace. Amen. Come on, would you stand with me? It's time for us to wrap it up today. But I say, Lord, just touch us. Touch us, Lord. Every one of us in this chapel today, Lord, as surely as you have reached out to us in grace, My goodness, you laid your life down for us. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Your grace is having a powerful, in fact, an eternal effect on us. And now, Lord, the least we could do in turn is is to tell others, to pray for others, to invite others, to reach out to others, to extend ourselves to people that we know that are going through difficult times. And, Lord, what they really need is help from heaven. So Jesus, we 
we commit ourselves before we go from church today lord we're, we're saying help us help us lord we we will be your representatives we we will be agents of grace I say, folks, don't be surprised if somebody crosses your path in the next day or two or three and they, they express in no uncertain terms that there are some sin issues in their life, there's some struggles they've been dealing with, and yeah, something needs to be going off inside of you saying, hey, this is a sinner that I, I need to be friendly toward. Not judge them, but help them in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, we commit ourselves to that. God, I pray that of all of us here today, I believe that we represent many, many contacts with other people. So help us, Lord, to receive revelation from Luke chapter 19. And so we're, we're ready to go home, Lord. I don't need to prolong this. But, God, I, I do believe Something of what you've said to us from your word today is going gonna, is gonna to directly be applied in, in, in our relationships, in our family circle, among our friends, believers, non-believers, colleagues at work, whoever it might be. But I pray something that we heard in church today is going to be activated in real life in that jungle out there. So help us, Lord. Bring people across our path. And uh, we will not hold out on them. We will reach out and speak the glorious name of Jesus into their life. Come on, folks. Before we officially dismiss, I would like to have the privilege of leading us in a simple prayer of salvation. That's always my greatest joy when Sundays come and go. Let's pray together. Let's pray the prayer of salvation. For many of you, this is reaffirming your commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. But there may very well be some here today in person or watching online, and, and you haven't yet made that, that all-important decision to say, Jesus, I, I need you in my life, and I, I realize that now. In fact, I would go so far, Lord, as to say, I admit I'm a sinner. I was born in that condition. And I need your saving grace. I want you to make the difference in my life. So my friend, if you've gotten away from the Lord and you know you need to recommit to Him today, or if you've never been born again, but you sure want to be, I invite you to pray this prayer with all the rest of us. Let's all pray this prayer together. But before we do, simple show of hands. If you, if you know, Pastor, I need to give my life to the Lord today or rededicate myself to the Lord today with every head bowed, every eye closed, all across the room in this personal moment of commitment. Just raise your hand if you know that's you. Yes, I see your hands up front here. Thank you. And toward the back, I see your hand as well. Good. You can put it down. And I see your hands over here up front, toward the back. Thank you. Good for you. Never regret the decision. Yes, I see your hand over by the wall. You will never regret it if you make the choice to run with Jesus and to run with others who are running with Jesus. Anyone else? Just wave at me wherever you are. Yes, I see your hand. Smart move. Thank you. Anybody else? Come on. Let's pray together, church. Would you join me? Let's all pray this. Heavenly Father, of course I give my life to you. Jesus, I know you're the Son of God. I totally believe you died on that cross to pay the penalty for my sin. I ask you to forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live out the Christian life and to be a friend to sinners just like you've been a friend to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Come on. Somebody give the Lord a shout of thanksgiving. Praise the name of Jesus. Well, hey. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that you were so encouraged by the worship and the message. 
And hey, if you've been blessed by the worship and the messages here at Gateway, we'd love if you partner with us. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give to do so. And if you're in the Regina area, we would love to have you join us in person for one of our services very soon. There's a chair here waiting for you. But if you're not able to make it in person in Regina, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for another Church Online.